Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back and we are talking this week, or at least for the next three days, on your 12-month repeat and referral real estate lead cash flow machine. You know, I may have, may have had too much caffeine when I was writing that title. <laughs> yes, That's, but it says what it is. It does. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through with a lot of detail, explaining to you exactly how you can create really a referral, you know, uh, repetitive system that does not cost you a lot of money. Really, at the end of the day... What we're going to ask you to consider doing for the sake of building your repeat and referral real estate lead machine is to do a lot of the good old fashioned real work of real estate, which is going to put you in front of, uh, you know, decision making adults that are ready to send you a referral or do business with you themselves. So get ready to take a lot of notes. Now, speaking of notes, our notes for today's show are below. So all you've got to do is scroll down and you're going to see we've organized all these notes. Uh, you also not hopefully not be very surprised to realize Julie and I do use notes and we stick to our notes throughout every single podcast. And we're also going to um, hopefully entertain you with some of our stories from clients who have followed these exact plans and the successes that they've had. That's right. So this is part one of a three-part series that will deliver to you your exact 12-month center of influence past client plan, otherwise known as repeat and referrals from your database. And this is the same plan used by many of our top coaching clients in all price ranges and market conditions. So Julie, let's just get right into it and let's go right to uh, part one. Yes, part one. So this part is about the, the mindset for actually making this work and how to set up your database for success. Everybody wants to know. You get texts about this. I get texts. We hear about it from the coaches. How do you actually create a steady flow of repeat and referral business? Well, here's the answer. Create a 12-month plan, not a 12-day, not a panic attack plan, a 12-month actual plan so that you can get into action and get out of the getting ready to get started to someday actually talk to my people mode. First, we're going to make sure that you're set up correctly and understand how to maximize your database, and then we'll get into the 12-month plan. So here's a fact. When you look at that amazing new listing that just hit the market and you see the listing agent and you ask yourself, how did that agent get that listing? It's almost always because the seller already knew that agent. Would you agree about that? Well, as you were reading that fact, I was just remembering back to when you and I sold real estate and how frustrating it was yeah. when, when we'd see That's a new right. listing come up and it was an agent who had never had a listing in that particular market who, you know, like for example, when we were selling a new Albany country mm -hmm. club who uh, you'd never heard of before and just the whole thing just seemed like it was an injustice, right? Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> we kind of felt a little outraged by that. Especially when it was one of our neighbors. And sure enough, 99.9% .9 of the time, it was because somehow that agent was in that uh, sellers, center of influence, and, and past clients. Mostly it was from a social center of influence. Almost always, right? Mm -hmm. So your goal then, knowing that, is to be the agent who the seller already knows and get that listing. So another fact, everybody loves repeat and referral business. That's why we're doing this podcast series. Why do you love that so much? Well, it's because the prospect already knows you. They already trust you. They know you're honest, you're ethical, and you'll take good care of them. If you could choose who your next buyer or seller would be, wouldn't you always choose somebody you already know? I think I would. So fact, a minimum of 10% of your database should be buying or selling with you every single year, assuming that you actually speak with them regularly. Notice I said speak, not text, not like, not share, but speak with directly. Many of our coaching clients track closer to a 40% of their business to their ever-expanding database. And I have to say some of my elite coaching members, they're more like 60 or 70% because they've really systematized this and they follow the plan that we're presenting this week. Now, you can only get these results when your regular communication is systematized. It won't happen if you only speak with your database when you're starving for new business or when you have time to get to it or when you just have a random assistant from time to, with time to burn, it's got to be systematized by you for you to get the results you actually desire. So here's the reason that we always ask new coaching clients and, uh, to build their centers of influence and past client system first. It's always the first book on your lead generation wheel. Uh, I'm going to go through this example. It's a it's just kind of a story, but it's also at the same time a great way to understand why this is so important. If you had to hire a roofer to fix the roof leak on your house, 
And, um, you know, this is something that needs to be done right away. You can't procrastinate anymore. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to ask yourself, do you know an existing roofer? Do you know of someone you've used in the past that you, guess what, know and trust that was it, you can call and you know for sure they're going to come out and fix the job and not, you know, not take advantage of you, not overbid it, you know, not show up six months from now, that kind of thing. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to your own personal database. Now, if you know that person, you're calling them, they're fixing the roof. If you don't, then what are you all going to naturally do? I want you to answer that question. Answer that question for reals, right? So you don't know a roofer, you now need to find a roofer. What 99%, well, technically, almost all of you are going to do is you're going to ask a trusted friend or an advisor for a referral to somebody that they, guess what, know, love, or trust that can fix your roof. That is how most people, and these studies have been done countless times, um, I, the, the lowest number I've heard of people that essentially choose who they're going to use as their service provider, the lowest number from either who they've used in the past or a referral from a trusted friend or advisor is 87%. Me too. We've seen those numbers creep up into the 90s before mm-hmm. this research has been done. But really, you don't have to uh, even read one of these long-winded research papers from an Ivy League university. You know mm-hmm. it's true. Look at your own behavior. And so what does that leave? It's arguably less than 10% of the time. That means people are going to make a decision who they're going to use to hire their real estate agent or to fix their roof from an ad. An ad does include branding. An ad is marketing. So why would you focus all your best energies? And this is, again, the reason that we have all of you, all of the new coaching clients, um, you know, build this first. So why would you choose and put to put money, effort, and time towards the thing that is going to get you statistically the least results? And it's not even the least results in the short term. It's the least results long term. It's their least results ever. A lot of marketing and branding and advertising people are telling you that you're investing into your future. Well, you're not really because an investment is something where you put the money in now and then it compounds, right? An investment's going to be something that's going to, without your continued effort, is going to continue to basically increase in value. Isn't that an investment? (laughs) But here's the thing about marketing, branding, and advertising. If you stop doing it, if you stop spending the money, if you stop making the effort, then you're going to get zero results ever. And what, again, the marketing and branding people don't tell you is that oftentimes the marketing and branding and advertising never works. And the way that they rationalize, or frankly, the way they try to get you to rationalize spending the money, time, and effort is by saying that it's going to be something that's one of these things that you can't really quantify because it builds your brand. It's because you want to have, you know, own this mythical, you know, real estate in people's brains so that when they think real estate, they think your name. All these sort of mythical, you know, woo-woo type thoughts about marketing, branding, and advertising. You haven't done it long enough. You haven't done enough pieces. You've got to stick it out. This is a long-term plan. And sometimes they'll even say, maybe you're terrible at returning calls. It's all about you. Right. They're going to not want to take responsibility for the results. You find a marketing, branding, and advertising company that tells you that we'll put it in right. We'll put it in writing that this effort, spending this amount of money will equal this result in this amount of time and you will have won a you know some sort of big prize because none of them are going to do it because they know it's mostly who you know malarkey who really malarkey, yes. <laughs> yeah that's really would you it. say that that's both uh you know traditional print marketing as well as online Yes, all of it. It's all the same. Because if you have to, again, go back to people's behaviors, you're now having to choose a roofer. You're going to use someone you've used in the past or use a referral from a trusted friend or advisor. And only then if you don't know someone in those two categories, which, I mean, if you think about it, listener, when was the last time you had to choose somebody to be a service provider where you weren't able to find somebody that you'd used in the past or weren't able to get a referral from a trusted friend uh, you know, th- that was able to send you their uh, suggested resource, mm-hmm. how often have you then leaned into an ad? Isn't that interesting? So your own behavior tells you that most people are not going to choose a real estate professional from an ad, and yet most of you are seduced into taking out ad, ads, marketing, and branding, and advertising. You've got to realize the marketing, branding, and advertising does have a place, but it's not your most dominant. Uh, it's not ever going to be a, the best source of business for you. And anybody who tells you that is frankly trying to sell you, guess what, marketing, branding, and advertising. Well, of course, and let me prove that first. I would uh, contend that the reason that you listeners use the lender you're using, the reason you use the loan officers that you use, your home inspector and your title company are why? Because you got it from a trusted friend or advisor, probably your broker, another agent that you respect, because you probably didn't know any of those people when you got licensed, did you? Your own behavior reflects this. Well, Julie, in all seriousness, I mm-hmm. want you to challenge yourself because as I'm thinking as I'm talking, when was the last time, when was the last time you actually bought something 
mm-hmm. from uh, a service provider. Okay, and I'm not saying like a, you know, but a service provider. When was the last time you mm-hmm. actually chose someone to work on one of our properties or provide any level of service to any aspect of any of our businesses that was from an ad? I can't even think of it. I'm going through my brain of things going on with the rentals. I mean, the the uh, fencing company, I know from when we sold real estate, all, all of those things we already knew or... I asked, you know, maybe Coach Rochelle, who's near our rentals, who she uses for things. I, I cannot come up with anybody. Right. And listeners, you're the same way. Now, I'm yeah. not saying when you're scrolling through Instagram, if you don't come across some sort of little ad that's going to, you know, offer some sort of, you know, whatever for your pet or something silly. That's sure. not the same thing. I'm talking about a high level referral from, you know, any, a real estate agent, for example, or even, a, frankly, somebody to fix your leaky roof. Yeah. So be very clear about this, because if you're not... And most people aren't, frankly. You're going to spend a lot of money, time, and effort. And it really breaks our hearts. And this is really what motivates us to be so, I think, um, (laughs) drilled down on our message is because literally hundreds of thousands of agents fail out of the industry every year. And most of those agents fail out of the uh, business because they were given the wrong information when they got into real estate. And what we just shared with you, if that's the only thing you ever hear from Julie and I's thousands and thousands of podcasts over the past, I think, 14 years, that's probably one of the most important messages. So if we were to get back into the business, if you want to take your business seriously, this has to be your first spoke. It cannot be your only spoke. Now, where does marketing, branding, and advertising come into place? If once you have your business uh, in the cash flow flowing from this and the other spokes that we teach you in Premier Coaching. If you want to enhance those things with marketing, branding, and advertising, go for it. But please do sure. not be seduced into thinking that you're going to be able to spend enough money and do enough branding, marketing, and advertising that all of a sudden it, you're going to be able to skip over the real work of real estate. That's what really is critically important. Which brings us full circle to your original point. Between 83 and 93% of decisions are made based on who you already know. So your job again, why we're doing this podcast series, is to be that agent. So let's do the math. When you have 100 names on your list, you know, your database, then yearly you should have 10 deals from them following the 10% minimum rule. If you don't, then you either don't have a great past client center of influence plan or you aren't working your plan consistently. Email is not enough. Posting on their Facebook and Instagram is not enough. Going to their holiday party is not enough. Well, let let me add to this too. So here's the fallacy in the center of having only centers of influence and past clients as your source of business, your center of influence, let's say you have a list of 300 people, those three, and let's say they're all homeowners, right? All those people and are in other agents, centers of influence and past sure. clients list. Those people are not exclusive to you. Those people are also being essentially marketed right. to at some level. And so is their spouse. Exactly. By a billion yeah. of other agents. So you're not, if you want to really get to the head of the line and really become the person they think of, when they're wanting to buy or sell or send a referral, you need to call them because everybody else is hitting the easy button and uh, dropping off the tchotchkes and doing the passive stuff, the digital stuff. The way you have an advantage in this marketplace, really any marketplace, is you do the opposite of what other people are doing. When everybody else is doing the passive stuff, I'm going to put my center of influence and past client plan on a CRM. We're going to drip on them. We're going to drop off forget me on seeds in April. We're going to have to drop off pumpkin pies in November. Look, do all of that if you want to spend the money and the time, but do not uh, avoid the actual real work, which is making the phone calls. That's right. It's in addition to, not instead of, well, the calls. It, but let's be honest. If you can only do one thing. You got to call. You got to call yep. because you will find calling is going to get you the result and the pumpkin pies in November, not necessarily if you, so if you just do the tchotchke drops off, drop off stuff and you don't make the calls, highly ineffective. If you do the calls, highly effective. If you do the calls and you drop off the stuff, it's highly effective and plus one. That's, That's right. basically it. Well put. Okay. So what, using our 10% minimum rule, when you build your list to 500 people, you can create as many as 50 or more deals per year. When you do this right, we have coaching clients who have achieved this, but again, they didn't do it in 30 days. They had to be consistent. Incidentally, when we asked our top 100 most influential agents, when we had that event and we gave them the, you gave them the question on a panel, what would you have done differently looking back on your career? Their number one answer of the top producing longtime veteran agents and brokers was, you guessed it, I would have done much more, a much better job with my past clients in Sphere. I would have communicated with them earlier and more consistently, and it would have saved me thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on producing new leads when I could have just had more repeats and referrals. 
So here's the secret, and I think you covered this. Avoid dependence on just electronic communication. There's no guarantee they got it, opened it, looked at it, or watched it. It's too passive and unpredictable. So we're moving on to four points of specifically how to actually set up your database so you'll actually use it. A lot of you guys struggle bouncing from database to database. You're not really sure who should go in there, how you should handle it, how you should set it up. So there's just four simple points. Number one, use something like KV Core or another CRM to set up and maintain your database. Take the time to gather phone numbers, email addresses, and social media information for each entry. We can stop on that point for a second because that's a great excuse to call you know, I'm updating my contact information. Do you still work at ABC Company? I've got your Facebook address is this, and obviously your phone number's right, or we wouldn't be talking. But that said, if you've got an old list, you can drop it into, there's a number of online companies that will actually scrub your old, old list and uh, give you the updated information. I mean, Lists USA, and there's some others that sure. do the same thing. If you've already got one, you've worked on. Yeah, but that said, save the time. But really, to Julie's point, if you've got a bunch of, which most of you will when you're getting started, you're going to have some information in your uh, who knows, your your phone directory, some old emails, some old deal files. Home Contacts in your iPhone. Right. So when we're getting started on this with a coaching client, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, you know, let's have a goal of in the next, say, 60 days, building your list up to 100 people. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do is we're going to take the number of work days, and there's, you know, 20 work days each month. So you're t looking at 40 work days over the next two months. And then every single day, we're going to have you, well, you know, you are going to research, um, find a person that's in your phone and all you have is their, you know, name and you have um, maybe a phone number, things like that. And then every day you're going to research that, you're going to update it, and then you're actually going to call them as well. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to build up the list. But there's, you have to do it systematically and you have to do it, uh, you have to put in the real work. You could hypothetically, like I said, use an online company like Lists USA to do a lot of this for you. You could, in this case, other than the calling, use a virtual assistant to do it for you, some stuff like that when you're getting your database up, but you cannot delegate the actual calling. That's right. And I like how you broke that down into just maybe five updates per day, because a lot of you guys don't do this because you've built it up into this massive project. I've got to update my database. And that's the beginning and the end of your thought process. You never do it because you think it's a huge project. Well, the other problem that agents do, and this is not necessarily the agent's problem, it's back crappy information problem, mm -hmm. is your CRM is not supposed to be some sort of multi-pronged, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, mythical Greek monster with a billion arms, right? <laughs> yeah. So many of you guys think that the more elaborate and complicated your CRM is, somehow that's a win. I'll share with you guys something that's not directly related to this topic, but the best salespeople in the world, that, and that is what you are, if you don't believe me, look at your real estate license, it says real estate salesperson, the best salespeople in the world have the fewest number of leads. And I know that sounds crazy, but they're also not going to have these gigantic databases. They're going to have, they're always pruning. They're always looking for reasons to essentially remove somebody. You know, I know that sounds like, you know, maybe kind of rude, but here's the reality of it. If you have thousands and thousands of leads in your CRM, you don't have a CRM, you don't have a leads list. What you have is basically a good old fashioned white pages. You have essentially missed the mark on really what the point of uh, having a CRM is. You're supposed to be absolutely positively pruning people, asking the you know pre-qualifying questions and looking for people that are going to buy or sell with you. You can change this, but realistically, no further out than maybe 120 days, maybe 180 days, depending on what time of year it is. If you're calling them in the, you know, let's say, uh, third quarter and they're not going to be transacting until spring of next year. Well, 180 days or less. You pre-qualified them. You know what their motivation is. You know what their time frame is. Put them in a drip campaign. But what a lot of you guys do is you gather all this information from all these people from every corner of the universe and you drop them into a drip campaign and you believe that because of all your clever marketing, emailing, videotaping and all the other stuff that those people, thousands and thousands of people, well, if the 10% rule is true, according to head coach Julie Harris, that if I have a a thousand people in my database. That'll be a hundred people. <gasps> what about 10,000 people? Magically, they will just drip on you. But that's not the way it works. No. The way it works is you need to have the people in your database that are just like with leads. With leads, you don't want a thousand leads. The best agents we've ever coached had the fewest leads. I already said that. Let me put numbers to it. I have there. You cannot successfully manage maybe more than 12 to 15 leads. It, those are really well qualified, ready to go, completely pre qualified, you know, home seller, home seller type leads. Those leads you don't want a bunch of because otherwise you'll stop, you, you'll uh, lose track of them all. 
And if you have a bunch of leads, the reason you do is because you're not calling them and pre-qualifying them. You're not asking time frame. You're not asking motivation. Well, you're confused be- the difference between a contact and a lead. Yeah. Agents will say, I've got 2,000 leads, right? No, you have maybe, you know, an epic amount of random contacts. You've dumped everybody in there from, you know, maybe a couple of open house lists and then your kid's school list and this and that. You said it right when you said that the most successful, most efficient uh, agents have a smaller list of contacts, but those contacts, if you were to call them, would be able to identify who they actually are. They've had real conversations. They know where they met each other. You know, it's a smaller but more um, detailed list, I would say. Well, and so that then translates into having fewer leads, but better quality leads and understanding the difference between a random contact slash, you know, phone book contact and an actual contact who knows who you are. That's who should go in your database. And that brings me to the second point here. Well, okay. Second point is, well, you know, who goes in your database. But here's the, here's the big takeaway that hopefully everyone's uh, gathering. The CRM companies know what I'm about to say is true. How do I know? Because they've told us what I'm about to tell you is true. Long-term lead follow-up does not work. Long-term lead follow-up does not work for the sake of generating closable transactions. Because what you guys do and what everyone has made the mistake of believing, so CRMs can't be in business if um, you guys are believing in long-term lead. I, they, they can't be in business if you don't believe in long-term lead follow-up, I should say. Because the CRMs are the ones that want you to believe that you have to be dripping on you know, 723, 1477, whatever the overly complicated <laughs> yeah. plan is that you guys are being seduced into believing. CRMs are one of the biggest uh, black holes of money that agents mm-hmm. spend money on every year for their businesses. And so the CRM companies want you to believe it's some big complicated thing. They've never sold real estate before. Right. They have nothing, in, uh, no reason for you not to believe that it needs to be complicated. And Julie and I are here to tell you for sure that your leads should be leads that are pre-qualified. You've used scripts. You know what their motivation is. And if you find yourself with too many leads, it's because you're not asking the tough questions. You're not using a pre-qualification script. Really important if you're right now experiencing a lot of frustration in your business. Because, and despite the fact you have a big CRM, it's for the reason we just told you. Well, so let me translate that because you gave them a lot of information there. You've got to be really clear that your database by itself is simply an organization tool. It is not to be looked at as prospecting for you all the time. Just because you have a database, just because you've got lots of people in it, does not equal repeat and referral business. And to your point, the CRM companies want you to think that it will without your effort. It is simply an organizational tool to keep you with your notes so you know who you're talking to when you make the actual calls. So let's go to who should actually go into your database. We talked a lot about who shouldn't go, random people who don't know who you are. Enter your past clients, people from your sphere of influence, and adopted clients to this list. Adopted clients are buyers who bought your listings. They worked with another agent most of the time, but you are adopting them. Treat them like your own. You can also add your professional sphere of influence, like home inspectors and mortgage lenders. Add details to each person to help you remember them. You and I have experiences all the time where we run into somebody and you and I are trying to remember, how do we know them? And so I've worked really hard to put into my contacts that, you know, we met them through school or we met them at the gym and their kid's name is this and they have a pet parrot and, you know, they moved from <laughs> Chicago and whatever so that we can have better conversations and we're not always going, how do I know you? Right? So you guys can do that with your database, especially we, when you're actually calling them. We live in Puerto Rico and yes, people do have pet parrots. Yeah. Some of them <laughs> yell at you when you walk by. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So number three, commit to adding at least five new people per week, not random people, people because of the rest of what we're going to coach you to do here, to the list from your closings, your clubs, your meetings, your organizations. Get into the habit of exchanging information on the spot when you make new connections. You can create micro lists using WhatsApp and examples of this would be your kids' fourth grade class parents or your five best golfing buddies. Your WhatsApp contacts should also be part of your larger database so they all get all of your real estate updates, not just your golf in- intel, for example. So you just said something important, and you and I screwed this up the other day. Okay. Yesterday. Mm-hmm. So you and I were sitting outside of the gym. <laughs> yes. Yes. And a very uh, a friend of ours uh, who we've known since we've moved here, who is very influential in the community, Frankly, he's one of the uh, most successful hedge fund guys uh, in the history of hedge funds. Yes. I, you know, anyone in the financial industry industry will know who this guy is. But anyway, so he asks us straight up, 
He goes, I sent you guys an invitation to a party I'm having Thursday night. I know. We're like, what? What? And he goes, he goes, and Julie and I are like really on top of those. And, you know, it's Usually. A very, it's a very <laughs> social community. Well, yeah. I sent it, he said, I sent it through WhatsApp. I sent it to Tim. And I'm like, okay. I had to get a new phone because my old phone crashed. And now I'm re- uh, remembering that I didn't up, you know, re-upload or whatever it is, WhatsApp to my phone. And sure enough... I, you know, essentially re-uploaded it to my phone and there were a whole bunch of messages I missed. Now, why am I telling you this? First of all, make sure that you are asking folks when they communicate with you, how they prefer to be communicated with. Julie and I prefer text, but evidently he prefers WhatsApp. Yes. And now we know. And, and he had copied me and I hadn't responded because I didn't recognize his phone number. So then I had to get into my contacts update his name and, you know, everything I knew about him into my contacts and then uh, put him both in WhatsApp and my contacts. So if, if I text, I know who he is. So, I mean, that it is more challenging than back when you only had the phone book because you've got WhatsApp, you've got Messenger, you've got Instagram, you've got Facebook, and you've got, you know, your voicemail. Well, let's give them some advanced coaching on this. Um, and so, guys, first of all, remember, you can join the Premier Coaching Program at any time. Scroll down. You can see the actual notes Julie and I used for today's show and join Premier Coaching. Premier Coaching is free, and yes, that does include a daily semi-private coaching call. Now, Julie and I are going to get into the weeds a little bit about uh, texting versus WhatsApp, and it's really important that you listen to what we're saying because in some cases it could save you an enormous amount of uh, money and uh, potential litigation. Are you ready, listeners? All right. This is important. This is important. When you're sending texts, straight text, using your carrier's SMS, you are automatically going to be subject to TCPA laws. So you are not going to be – like if you're texting your neighbor – about, uh, you know, whatever, right? Some social text. In other words, it's consumer to consumer. You aren't uh, going to be held responsible for TCPA. But if you, Mr. Real Estate Agent, are texting your neighbor, asking them about real estate or, you know, having some, you know, arguably uh, business-focused conversation, you now are a business to consumer uh, text. If that neighbor, turns out they don't like you, If that neighbor decides that they're going to uh, say, well, I didn't give you permission to text me. Why are you texting me? You know, this is a solicitation that I did not request and I did not opt into. You now are subject to TCPA laws and you can actually be sued. They can actually go after you for having sent them that text. Now, I see agents, that not as bad as it used to be, honestly, but mm. I see agents making horrendous mistakes where they're spam texting. Right. Where they'll get people's text email, mm. or they'll get their, okay, please opt in, or uh, I'm sorry, sign into my logbook, or even opt in on my website, and you collect a certain number of phone numbers, or, you know, logbook from an open house or whatever, and without their specific uh, approval and permission, you are now texting them. And I'll give you guys an example. So if you want to join Premier Coaching right now, you can text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. And remember, message and data rates may apply. Now, go ahead and do that now. And then you're going to see the entire process as is required by the law. And you're going to see it's a huge pain in the butt. You now are going to get a, you're going to text and then you're going to get a message. And the message is asking your explicit permission for me to then text you again to which you're going to have to say yes. And then you're going to get the text to the link to the Premier Coaching page. By the way, you can just text the link in the show description and just go right over the uh, Premier uh, page and join Premier Coaching or just go to premiercoaching.com. So there are a lot of landmines if you're going to start texting people as your primary source of um, communication. Now, if someone texts you first and it's a consumer texting you about real estate, then you're allowed to text them back. But if you start spam texting them, you guess what? Have fallen back into the, you know, the potential litigation issues with regards to TCPA. There have been significant um, lawsuits that have been successfully filed against people in the mortgage and real estate industry because of the fact they've been spam texting. All right, that is the reason that WhatsApp is maybe a, the preferred app of most mm-hmm. people because WhatsApp is technically and not underneath, if I understand this incorrectly, someone will correct me, but I believe this is correct. WhatsApp is outside of the TCPA rules. So you can t- you can have lots of people in, the t- in your WhatsApp uh, groups. And by the way, WhatsApp is a hell of a lot easier to organize than any sort of texting. You can form groups, you can remove people. Like if you started, if you sent a text to, you know, a whole bunch of people, 10 people, um, just good old fashioned SMS, inviting them to a party or an open house or something, you can't, like that group stays, uh, uh, it, you can't add people or remove them. Whereas on 
uh, WhatsApp, you can. And and I think part of it is also because uh, when you're adding WhatsApp, you would you would ask, um, do you want to be part of my you know housing news WhatsApp? And I would say yes, please add me. And I think that that helps you know with right. The but it's outside. From what I understand, WhatsApp you can't like if someone spams you in WhatsApp, you can't uh, the the TCPA laws don't protect. Uh, the, the, you know, air quoting, protect the consumer the same as, say, for example, if you received a cold solicitation. Like you and I sure. get cold, unsolicited solicitations a lot. from people who are, quote unquote, wanting to buy one of our rental properties because Julie and I have dozens of rental properties. And so what these are, these are companies that are essentially generating leads and then they're selling those leads back to investors. And that's what they're doing. They're just illegally cold spamming people who mm-hmm. they, they have phone numbers for. And they, have, they know those people have rental properties. Don't do crap like that. No. Nope. Additionally, don't buy leads from companies that do stuff like that because you can be pulled into the litigation and it, because it does happen. It happens frequently. There's, you know, that's it. That's the whole thing. Don't spam text. If you're going to be texting uh, for uh, the sake of re- reinforcing conversations, use WhatsApp. And there's some other apps that are similar to that. There's another mm-hmm. one I can't quite think of right now. Uh, if you guys have any comments on this or if I said anything incorrectly about I'm not no expert. I'm just, you know, relaying experiences to you. Bottom line is be very careful when you're SMSing. That is really yeah. the bottom line. Which brings us back to pick up the phone and talk to people. Yeah, exactly. So is that. Okay. So point number four, update your database weekly as part of your minimum daily minimum standards. Commit to never letting it get out of control, neglected or outdated again. You have to actually use it for it to work. Again, it is the communication tool that is supporting this spoke of business for you. So that's probably where we should leave this, and we'll do part two and three in the next days. The only asset from your real estate business is your centers of influence and past client lists. You guys, and and this is the unfortunate truth, the, your business, your real estate practice, and I don't be offended by what I'm saying, it's just statistically true, has no value. You're not going to sell it because it's based on you. I've yep. got systems, I've got people, i got a team. It's still based on you. You cannot success, successfully sell your business. If you don't believe me, put your business for sale and try to get like five times net income or, you know, two times your gross revenue, whatever. Try to try to actually sell your business. What you'll discover, it's unsellable. You could sell it to maybe a team member. You could sell it based on referrals. You know, it, somebody pays you 40% the first year, 30%, 20% of any business that comes from your center of influence and past client list. But the point is, is your center of influence and past client list is the only asset of your real estate practice. That's the only thing that you know, that you're actually building that has any value. And by the way, you can build this up and you then can hypothetically quote unquote retire or move out of the market in which you previously were selling real estate and then uh, don't publicize that you've moved, continue to market to your centers, you know, call your centers of influence and past clients from the old uh, market. And when you get those uh, leads in, you can then refer them to agents back in your marketplace. And nowadays agents are more than willing to pay 35% That's referral for fees. Sure. We have known many, many people who've gotten into the business, been very successful for long periods of time. And that's essentially was their exit plan by building a center of influence, past client, uh, very you know viable database, and then referring out those leads when they came in. You guys can do the same thing, but be very clear. This is your first spoke when you're building your real estate business. Take it seriously because over time, and usually if you do this seriously for two or three years, depending on how many houses you're selling, obviously, or how diligent you are about this, this will sometimes, like I remember very clearly when Julie and I were selling real estate, we started out by doing a lot of proactive lead generation. Then we did proactive lead generation that was enhanced by marketing. But after, it was probably about year four, maybe year three, we, we obviously kept track of where all of our de- uh, lead sources were. I remember it, the centers of influence and past client lead referral sources started to match even the leads that Julie and I were getting from proactive lead generation. And then it was probably about year five when we added up, it was like maybe like July or something. We added up, we had close to a hundred deals and then we went and tracked to, you know, added up exactly what percent came from this, what percent came from this, what percent from came from this. And guess what? It was exactly like what we just told you. It and was, it was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful and thing. And I wish we would have done more work on it sooner. A hundred percent. You know, and again, to your point earlier in today's podcast, if we were to get back into selling real estate today, Absolutely. Not only would we work this more and more consistently, but in many different areas. One of the things we're talking about in coaching right now with the market changing is you've got to be talking to 
more people more frequently in a larger variety of areas. And we'll talk on uh, tomorrow and the next day's podcast about how to expand your sphere of influence, how to make sure you're talking to enough people so that you're getting those results. But yeah, I, I would, and we say this a lot on the podcast, I would work this really hard uh, and be way more social and way more on top of things like what, what's happened, stuff like that. And of course, the other side of it, prospect for sale by owners and expired. So you're balancing that between people who already know, love, and trust you, your favorite lead source, as well as people who want to transact today for sure. That's right. So, and so that's it. You guys, uh, we will pick up uh, with part two tomorrow. In the meantime, as always, thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Oh, I didn't tell you. What? So our YouTube channel, we've had uh, in the last 12 months, 2.5 million downloads. That is a lot of downloads. I know between the, yeah, the between awesome. the podcast downloads mm -hmm. and between the YouTube channel this year we're going to have um, let me add it in my head get it cracked between six and seven million. It's amazing. Uh, exactly, it is amazing. Well, thank you guys for <laughs> being loyal listeners, and if you're new, welcome. Keep listening, and also thank you for sharing this podcast. We'll see you tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. dot <laughs>